Well, there is coming a day when no heartaches shall come. There'll be no more clouds in the sky and no more tears will dim the eye. And all is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. give thanks to the Lord for that precious promise. What a day that will be. We gather today to give honor to and celebrate the love and the life of Bonnie S. Yellett, born April 17, 1935, and passed from this life to her eternal home on July 12, 2020. Surrounded by her family at home. She was a resident of De Quincey and a faithful member of the Pentecostal Church of De Quincey, where she, for many years, used her talents for the Lord, serving in the ladies' ministry, serving as Sunday school teacher, a Bible quiz coach, a hostess, and bereavement hospitality coordinator. She could often be found in the church kitchen making pies, peanut brittle, baked beans for a barbecue to raise funds for their church, or sewing for Tupelo Children's Mansion, or the Dorcas New Beginnings Ministry. Bonnie will be remembered as a virtuous woman who put God first in all things and her family a very, very close second. She enjoyed traveling with her family and church friends. 
shopping and helping in any way that she could. And her green thumb aided in her love for working in her yard. Her strong will, unwavering faith, words of wisdom, her giving spirit and teaching hands made her the true matriarch of this family. And her family will always treasure the memories of vacations, barbecues with homemade peppermint ice cream, Sunday dinners, millionaire candy, and her special ability to make even the ordinary seem special. On February the 21st, 1952, Bonnie married Avery Yellett. She was the love of his life and his beloved wife for 68 years. She was the affectionate mother to Roxy Jackson and her husband Benny and to Ava Sue Yellett. And she was the doting grandmother known as Mama to Amanda Guerrero and her husband Mark. And great grandmother are known as Bon Bon to Stella and Luciana Guerrero, all residents of De Quincey. And Bonnie was preceded in death by her parents, James M. and Anna Mae Royer. Today, we sorrow. But as the scripture says, we do not sorrow as those who have no hope. But rather today, we choose to give thanks to God for all of the good and precious memories that we all have and you share with one another. But most of all, we give thanks For that great hope that we have in Jesus Christ. That come, that even though we sorrow, the Bible tells us that there'll be times of sorrow and we sorrow for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And the hope that we have is the promise that there is a morning coming. It's a resurrection morning, it's a reunion morning, and it's coming someday. Very soon. To each one of this family. All of our love. All of our prayers. And all of our support. Are with you all today. And in the days to come. We love you. And God bless you. It is with mixed emotions. That I stand before you. Today. Death is never a pleasant thing for any of us. Yet we do not understand that God looks at death so differently than do you and I. To us it is a parting, but to God it is a home going. I was looking and the Lord impressed me Sunday morning with the instance in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts where Saul had been converted. He was not yet named Paul the Apostle. And he began to preach stronger and stronger. And as he did, the Jews conspired against him and decided to stone him. The disciples, the very ones that Saul had persecuted and come against, came together at nighttime, put him in a basket, and lowered him over the walls so that he could escape the stoning that his enemies had planned for him. I want you to know that Sunday, God devised a plan and put Bonnie in her basket and let her escape over the wall. If we could understand the love that God has for you and I, she is now dwelling eternally in that place that we call heaven, We call it Beulah Land, the Promised Land, many different things. But it is at rest. It is our Father's house. So Bonnie is no longer in pain. She is no longer in suffering. She has escaped over the wall. This indeed is a time of mourning in our flesh. We have lost a great treasure. Avery has lost a wife. Roxy and Ava have lost a mother. Amanda has lost a grandmother. Stella and Lucy have lost a great-grandmother. Other family members, 
friends, so our flesh should mourn and weep and have sorrow. Yet we sorrow not as those who have no hope. She has escaped over the wall. She is in that better place. She is in that place where the old song says, there's no more crying over there. No more dying over there. There's no more pain over there. There's no more sickness over there. There's no more sorrow or woe over there because it's in my father's house. There is peace, wonderful, sweet, marvelous peace. So Bonnie has gone to her father's house. What a joy divine to know that after all of the years of living for God, she has come to the place where now she is gathered back again with the great God of the universe who has created her. What peace, what peace, what peace. This life has not had in the last little while much peace for Bonnie, but now she dwells in peace evermore. If we could but just get a glimpse of her brand new life, her brand new home, it would give perspective in what it means to be faithful until the very end. I wish today that there were words that could be said, actions that could be taken, that would somehow take away all of our grief and sorrow. But unfortunately, there is nothing that any of us can say or do. But we have hope. We have hope. Wonderful hope. I sat down and penned a letter to Bonnie upon her home going. And I wrote this, and I'll share it with you today. Dear Bonnie, all of my life there has been Bonnie. You were always so prim and proper, every inch a lady. Avery said it best, you were a virtuous woman. You have been faithful until the very end of life's journey. It seems as though your lot in these later years was to endure hardness as a good soldier. And you did, but you made it. We already miss you. We are so sad that you had to go. We just didn't have enough time. But a hundred years would not be enough time. We will endeavor to follow the path that you trod. We will keep the faith. We shall do our part to represent Christ in this world, a world full of darkness, sorrow, sin, and pain needs the light of the gospel. Your pain and suffering are now over. We still have to face all of that. Life still offers many hard blows to us that remain. Yet we shall be overcomers just as you are an overcomer. The same Christ that dwelt in you now also dwells, abides within us. Surely it won't be long until we all join you in that heavenly home. Wait for us. Look for us. Save us a spot close to the throne right beside you. We do not say goodbye, but good night, for we shall see you in the morning. God bless this family today. To Avery, to Roxy, to Ava, to Amanda, to Stella, to Lucy, to Benny and Mark. I pray in this time of grief and sorrow, remember, remember her godly example. Remember the good times that you enjoyed. Remember the love that she embraced you with. Remember 
that if we are to see her again on that glad getting up morning, we must have the same experience that she took with her to the other side, that we can also be faithful unto the end. God bless you all. I cover you with my prayers. I love you all. And with sorrowful heart in my flesh, I bid good night to Bonnie. But with joyful anticipation, I say, I'll see you again in the morning. A lady in town called me yesterday and she said, I got tired reading the obituary of all the things that Bonnie Yellett did. She was a busy lady, wasn't she? They asked me to share a few thoughts and so I made a few little notes here. In the latter part of the English Standard Version, it says, you received without paying, give without pay. And that's exactly what Bonnie did. She was always willing to share her talents without any pay or recognition. And after I read that obituary, I thought, what am I going to say? But I've dug a few little things out that maybe hadn't been mentioned. Girls, I'm sorry, I might get ahead of you. I remember when we first came here, they were deep into peanut brittle. Then we passed on to making pies and... Then we did thousands and thousands of decorated chocolate Easter eggs, and Sister Bonnie had the only hands, except I think for Jean Smith, that could touch the eggs without melting them. And she's the one who did all of the transferring. And she was right in the middle of everything. All of those things were for Mother's Memorial. And you know, several years we were number one in the nation. Bonnie Yellett did her share of that. Tupelo Children's Mansion contacted us about doing some sewing. Why? Because they had heard we had some excellent seamstress in the church. So we made baby layettes for Tupelo New Beginnings when they first opened. They took some to General Conference and that auctioned them off for thousands of dollars. So De Quincy, we helped in that situation too. Sister Tenney called and asked because she knew we had some very talented ladies. If we would do some special banners, they must have been 10 feet tall and millions of sequins and all of this kind of stuff. But, you know, we came through. She worked tirelessly on that project. Some of you may remember that she gave a sewing class. I had a lady tell me yesterday she still had the dress that Sister Bonnie helped her make. We had a ceramic class. She was involved in that. She was really special in the area of ministering to bereaved families. I wonder how many roast, rice, and gravy she made. She'd call me and she'd say, Sister Hennigan, they have roast on sale this week. I'm going to buy a few and put them in the freezer. She was always so faithful. During the construction of this building, there was a few ladies who worked just like men out here. And Sister Bonnie was one of them. Was it fun? Yes. Was it hard work? Yes. But I never heard her complain. And there was a time that she was the secretary of the women's ministry. She had an eye for detail. And she could tell you to the penny what was spent and what came in and what went out. She was always, always meticulous. There was an ever question of her dedication and her honesty. And the God that I know she served and that I serve keeps meticulous records. And I kind of have an idea. She's probably right there at the top. She loved her family. She loved her church. She was a lady, and I'm going to miss her, and I'm going to miss her millionaires, too. She always shared. She was my friend. She just took a shortcut to glory, and we'll see her again. I love you, family. Yeah.
So I'm the favorite grandchild, if you didn't know. Um, it was always our joke because I was introduced as the favorite because I was the only grandchild. Um, well, that was at least until Stella and Lucy came along and Mama became Bon Bon. And she was Bon Bon to two little girls who got away with a whole lot more than I did. So Mama kept me when I was growing up. We lived right down um, through the field from my parents. Um, and when my mom couldn't find me in the yard playing, it was because I was at Bon Bon's house. Now, Bon Bon is the one that taught me how to iron. I started on my grandfather's handkerchiefs. I remember one time, um, I must have had a little belly back then, and I ironed across my belly. And she put me in front of the freezer and opened the door, and I had to stand there so the burn could cool. 
Um, and then she would pull chairs up and teach me how to wash dishes. And it wasn't work back then. It was fun because I could use as many bubbles as I wanted. Um, and at midnight when I would stay with them, I always woke up because Bon Bon was going to fix me vanilla wafers and peanut butter with a glass of milk. Now, Bon Bon loved me, but she also corrected me. And if you notice the fly swatter in the wreath, it stayed on top of the refrigerator because when I was um, not following the rules at Bon Bon's house, the fly swatter would be lovingly applied to my thighs. Um, only a couple times, because then when she would reach for it, I would say, no fly swatter, bon bon bon. And that was all that needed to be done. So I'm pretty sure my parents fed me, but for some reason it wasn't as good as Bon Bon's food. So when I would eat supper, I would make my way through the field to her house. And if it was spaghetti night or chili burger night, she would ask if I was hungry, and I would say, yes, my mama doesn't feed me. So she would then call Roxy and get on to her for not feeding me, and mom would say, I did feed her, I promise, but it wasn't as good as Bon Bon's. Now, if you knew, you know, my grandmother, um, she was very meticulous, very clean, very prim. So on rare occasions, she would fry food, but in order for that to happen, she would have to take newspapers and tape it up all around the wall and over the top of the stove, so if grease splattered, it didn't get anywhere. And then when it was finished, we cleaned and wiped up because that was just how Bon Bon was. Now, I spent many of vacations with them, and once or twice they thought they would leave me. So one year, they took me to the Houston Zoo as if that would make up for not going to Tennessee. But on the way home from Houston, I popped my head up between the seats and said, just so you know, I'm still going to Tennessee with you. And I did. And on another occasion, they thought they would leave me, and they got about 10 miles down the road and felt so bad they had to come back and pick me up. And I hopped in the car, dirty and all, because if I took time to take a bath, they might leave me. Now, the special thing about vacations with Bon Bon is I sat in the back seat with her, and she had a picnic basket. And this picnic basket would come out about a week before and she would start putting all the snacks that we would eat in that basket. And we would make it to about Singer, and Pop Ave would be hungry, and we would start taking out sandwiches and chips and making snacks to eat in the car on the way to vacation. One of our last weeks together, I told her, I said, well, Bon Bon, we just got a new motor home, so next time we go to Branson, you can go with us, and I have a refrigerator, so you won't have to, you know, pack your ice chest or your picnic basket. And she said, oh, but that won't be as fun because she made everything fun, even the picnic basket. So growing up, I remember the things Sister Hennigan talked about. I remember serving food alongside her at funerals and how I would sit in the kitchen as she would spend hours on the phone calling and lining up a menu for the family that just lost a loved one. I remember those chocolate Easter eggs and how they would be decorated, and I remember the peanut brittle and the pies and the baked beans that she made with Sister Romaine at barbecues. But what's funny is, thinking back over my life with Bon Bon, she was an elaborate gift giver. She gave a lot at Christmas and birthdays and Easter baskets. And I can remember a few gifts, but I remember the memories. She taught me lessons throughout my life of how to be a homemaker, a Christian lady. And even upon her passing, the lesson that she has taught me is it's not in the gifts that you buy, the materialistic things that you do, but it's in the memories that you make. Well, I can't ad-lib as much as Amanda, so mine's a little prepared, but Mom would be proud of Roxy and I. We procrastinated again. I finished mine up this morning, but it wasn't because we didn't try. I started on it earlier. Um, we weren't, we're not the plan ahead people like my mom is. Um, but to know my mom, you had to really know my mom. At surface level, she was a wonderful person. Many of your comments described her as sweet, precious, kind, 
And she was definitely all of that to us, but so much more. The real treasure lied deep within her and made her the very special person that she was. She was a God-fearing woman with a servant's heart. She loved to give more than receive. She never wanted to be the center of attention. She was one of those people who was content to work in the background to make the outcome successful. She was a prayer warrior and was full of faith and love. She was a simple lady, but very elegant. And yes, my mom was in every sense of the word a lady. She was soft, but could be firm when necessary. In the end, she was fragile, but still oh so tough. She was a fighter to the end. Until the very end, she was still praying for her family and loving them with a love so fierce. I remember Saturday when I was talking with her, she started crying. Of course, I don't know what she was trying to tell me, but Amanda told me she was worried about me and I needed to let her know I was going to be okay. My mom was the one person I could never fool if I was telling, when I wasn't telling the truth when I told her I was okay, but I really wasn't. But I guess Saturday, I was able to convince her I would be okay, and it was okay for her to go on home. If you ask my dad how long he was in the Army, he will tell you 21 months and 29 days. I decided to calculate our time with mom the same way. She was a wife, friend, soulmate, and the love of my dad's life for 68 years, 4 months, and 21 days. She was a loving mother, friend, and everything we needed to Roxy for 66 years, 7 months, and 8 days, and to me for 58 years, 5 months, and 16 days. God actually smiled on me and gave me 49 additional days because I was born 7 weeks early. I was her miracle baby. To Amanda, she was a grandmother in title but oh, so much more for 40 years, nine months, and 17 days. To her latest pride and joys, her great-grandchildren, she was Bon Bon de Stella for nine years, seven months, and eight days, and Lucy's Bon Bon for six years, 10 months, and 22 days. Although she was Benny's mother-in-law in title, she looked on him as a son for 43 years, one month, and nine days. And she was grandmother-in-law to Mark for 11 years, one month, and six days. Although it seems like a lot of time, we would all say it still wasn't enough. But during that time, the legacy and memory she left will forever be treasured in my heart. My mom and dad had such a love for each other, and our home was always filled with love. Even in the end, when she could no longer express herself, the love in their expressions to each other was still known. My dad would walk up and kiss her and say, you're still my sweetheart, give me a kiss. And you could see the love just flowing from my mom's eyes. He would say, you're so beautiful to me. My dad told me the other day, he would have spent his last nickel on my mom, and he would have, but the feeling was mutual. Daddy, Thank you for giving your girls, and that's all five of us, an example of what it means to love until death do us part. Normally when my mom was addressing my dad, it was usually honey, and mom was my dad's sweetheart or darling. However, when daddy was tuning her out with his selective hearing, it then became Avery, or if he really wasn't listening, Avery Nathan. To the average person who really didn't know my mom, they may not have considered it love if they walked in and she was fussing at my dad for something he shouldn't have been doing, like getting out and getting too hot or putting himself in a situation where he could get hurt. But that was her deep love for him. Now it was okay for my mom to fuss at my dad, but she didn't want anyone else to fuss at him. 
My mom always knew how to get my dad inside when she felt he had been piddling around outside too long. If Roxy or I were there, she would usually say, ask your daddy if he wants some coffee if I make it. And of course, there was going to be cookies and cake. You couldn't just drink coffee. If we weren't there, she would usually holler at him and tell him she was making coffee. And that always did the trick. During my dad's working years, I remember she would always put on a fresh pot of coffee about the time my dad would be getting home from work. Now, I was her baby, and yes, I was definitely spoiled, but she didn't want anyone, not even to Roxy or Daddy, talking about how spoiled I was. Now, anyone who knows me knows I'm a little domestically challenged. I remember once when either Daddy or Roxy was saying how I needed to start learning to cook and take care of myself, Mom was quick to let them know I could cook if I wanted to. I just didn't have time. Even when she no longer had the ability to be the mom I knew, she was still telling me things she was going to help me do when she could get out of that wheelchair. I owe a lot to my mom. I may not even be able to walk today had my mom not had the faith to have Brother Bennett pray for me before his sermon one night. I don't remember any of this, but from what I've been told, one night before Brother Bennett was about to preach, my mom went up and asked for prayer for my feet. At the time, I couldn't walk without corrective shoes. When they got home that night and mom had already put me to bed, I went walking in the kitchen where they were without my corrective shoes. Thank you, Mom, for moving by faith so I could be able to walk. Some memories I will always cherish about my mom. One was the way she woke me up when I was little. She would get up and have my breakfast fixed, which was usually two pieces of toast when the butter melted with honey and chocolate milk. Then she would come softly, say my name, and kiss me. Many times, she would carry me to the kitchen counter to eat my breakfast. Then as I started working at night when I would get home from work, she would usually ask if I had eaten anything. If my answer was no, then we would try to decide what I wanted to eat. If nothing appealed to me, she would suggest my go-to favorite, chili burger with mayo and cheese. Even her last few years when she couldn't go shopping, she would ask if I wanted something to eat. Then she would say, I don't know what we have in there. I haven't been able to go to the store. I remember all the beautiful clothes my mom made for me. And for over half my life, that was at least 75% of everything I wore. At Christmas, it was usually a velvet dress. And she despised sewing velvet because it was so hard to sew on but she never let her stop that from doing it. Whatever mom made, it was always very special and made with love. No pattern, not a problem. She would just put several together or make her own. As I got older, I would usually purchase the shoes first, then she would design the outfit around the shoes. Many times, my mom would not even have a new outfit, but she made sure her girls did. And when Amanda came along, mom got such joy from making many of her frilly outfits. And anybody that knows Amanda knows she does not like frills. My mom never asked for a lot for herself. When you would ask mom what she wanted for any special occasion, birthday, Mother's Day, or Christmas, her normal response was, I can't think of anything I need or want, but I don't want you to spend a lot of money on me. I never had to be ashamed of my mom embarrassing me in public by the way she looked. My mom was always going to look classy when she went anywhere, even to the grocery store. I remember when I was still at home and she and daddy were getting ready for church. If mom didn't lay out his clothes, he would find out what she was going to wear and they would make sure they were going to match. She would always make sure her purse matched what she was wearing, and it was going to have Kleenex and candy. I always knew if I needed a Kleenex in church, I could ask mom, and she would have an extra one. And mom would be so proud of me and Amanda today. We made sure we got some matching purses. 
I remember all the nights she scratched my back and no one could scratch your back like mom. She always had long fingernails and just the right touch. I remember her arms wrapped around me when I was hurt, scared, or just needed a hug. And she always knew when a hug would help. She knew when I just needed to vent and would let me talk. She knew just what to do when you were sick. She always believed in me, and she pushed me to accomplish things I couldn't have accomplished without her support. She was also always there for me during the good times and the bad, except this time. This is the first loss I've had to experience without my mom by my side. But she spent 58 years, 5 months, and 16 days instilling faith, and a love for God in me. And this one thing I know, his grace is sufficient and he will be there for me through this difficult time. Mom, I'm so thankful God chose you to be my mom. No other mom could have taken a child that wasn't supposed to live and helped them become the person you've helped me to become. I'm thankful for every one of your traits I inherited, and in your passing, I sure hope God chose to leave me your traits I definitely need help with. There's not enough time or words to tell everyone what you were to me, but that's okay. You and I didn't always need words. Being in each other's presence was enough. Now, Mom, I don't want you to worry about Daddy because Roxy, Amanda, and me are going to look out for him. Amanda already took care of him today and washed and ironed his shirt for him. And I don't want you to worry about me because Amanda told you she was going to look out for me. And I know if Amanda told Mom all that, she will. Mom, Sunday at 1025, you gave me more to go to heaven for than I have ever had. So now I tell you, not mom, I love you. See you in the morning, Lord's willing. I don't know how long the night will be. Some nights seem longer than other nights. But I know through the teaching and word of God you have planted in me. And through all those prayers you have prayed for me. And the support of all those left behind. I will see you in the morning on the other side. Well, as y'all know by now, I'm the oldest. And there's eight and a half years difference between me and Ava Sue. And my daddy used to say, we learned on you. And I'm like, yeah, you sure did. But my mother, there aren't words adequate enough to describe my mother. She had a heart of a servant. And she had the hands to match. God was her number one priority in everything that she did. When there was decisions to be made around the house, her and Daddy would pray about it. If they couldn't agree on it or they didn't feel something from the Lord, they stood still. Her family was next in line. And at a very young age, I was taught how to work for the Lord. I wasn't just told by Bonnie Sue what to do. I was shown. My mother was an example. If there was work going on at the church, we were there. And I remember, it's just a little bitty thing. Sister Catherine Isdale was in charge of the ladies group. And they were making donuts. And you know, with Sister Catherine, 
There wasn't anything about idle hands. So they got a little stool, and she put me up on that stool, and my job was to cut the holes out of the donuts. And I can remember that. My mom was a homemaker. We always had home-cooked food. It was a treat for us to have a Coke or chips or something like that. If we had cookies, they were usually homemade. My mom washed, and she ironed. She kept house. And the one thing I remember, my mom used to dust mop her kitchen floor every night. And she would always sweep the trash over in the corner, never pick it up or sweep it outside. And I would ask, said, Mama, why do you do that? Why don't you sweep the trash out? She said, no, Roxy, because if you sweep trash out after dark, you're sweeping somebody out of the family. Always the next morning, my mom would get up, and she would finish sweeping it out, but never at night time. My mom would wax her floor. She had wood floors. And you could see your face in my mom's floors. And the way she got them like that is when she waxed them, she had an old sheet she put down. And she'd call me and she'd sit me on that sheet. And she would drag me all over that floor. I was her buffer. She would buff those floors. It was fun for me, but it was work for mama. Mother didn't do things to get recognition or money. I remember the old parsonage out here. I would see my mom on her hands and knees a lot of times. A mom wasn't good enough because a mom didn't always get everything. She would be on her hands and knees mopping the parsonage floor because she was doing that for God. And I was taught that you do things for the Lord as a service. God's going to always take care of you. And when I was in school, we had room mothers back then. And my mom would, like Ava said, was never embarrassing to us. She was always the best dressed. But my mom always brought homemade stuff. And all the kids would say, what's your mom bringing? What's your mom bringing? And my mom's was always usually the first to go. My mom's hands were hands of love, but they were also hands of discipline. And on numerous occasions, I was on the receiving end of those hands of discipline. I didn't realize until I became a mother that she disciplined me because she loved me. My mother was a very godly example to me. She practiced what she preached. I can never, ever remember my mother being untruthful to me. When she told me something, that's how it was. I can remember when she was the junior quiz coach and I had the senior quiz team and we got the new... Uh, fellowship hall over here and they needed a microwave and mama said we can bake pies and the quiz team can buy a microwave so my mom and me and Edith Dickerson made chocolate lemon and coconut pies and that's back when you sold them for three dollars a piece and my job was going to deliver those pies we already had several orders and I'd take them to town to deliver them, and people would see them, and they're like, where did they come from? And I'm like, oh, we're making them for the church. Well, I can't, can I get one? Sure, sure. You know, I'd come back with three or four more pie orders. That went on for about three or four times of delivery. And I remember the last time I walked out, she said, Roxy Yvonne, don't you come back with any more pie orders today. And when she put the Yvonne on it, I knew I better listen, but we raised enough money to buy a microwave for the church kitchen over there. My mom was always sewing and using her talents, and I remember when this virus came around and I was helping to make masks for a group, 
And my mom said, I wish that I could sew and I could help you. She always wanted to help, even in her wheelchair. And I said, well, Mom, I said, you think you could cut some elastic? So we rolled her down to my house in her wheelchair and helped get her up in the house. And she sat at my table in her wheelchair and Daddy on the other side. And she, she would cut the elastic because she was helping to make masks for our calls. The last two years of my mom's life were hard for her because she always loved church. She wanted to go to church. And the menu time I would be, when I'd come down, she'd be reading her Bible or she would be praying. And I remember one day I said, Mom, do you feel like praying over me? And I laid my head in her lap. And she took her little feeble hands and she put on my head and oh, did she pray. <laughs> the Spirit of God was so real and she began to pray in tongues and she blessed me. <laughs> and she prayed for Ava and Amanda and Stella and Lucy. <laughs> That's what my mom lived for. When I would leave, I would say, Mom, I got to go. I love you. She said, I love you too. I said, I'll see you later. She said, okay. I know that my mom is out of that wheelchair. That's what she wanted to be. She said, Foxy, I want out of this wheelchair so bad. And one day when we were praying, she looked at me with this most beautiful expression on her face smiling and she said I'm going to walk again I said yes mom you are well mom I know you're walking and you're shouting and you're not in pain and for that I'm thankful and I know that my mom is just on a journey right now that I can't go but mom I love you and I'll see you later. Thank you. 
Amen. Well, we greet all of you in the name of the Lord. And to each of you that have participated in this service, this has been a beautiful service. And thank you for all of your kind words. To each of you that are here, I know that your presence alone, you being here, there are no perfect words to say that can take away the pain and the grief, but your presence and your love speaks volumes to this family. And I know that they sincerely appreciate you being here. To this family, to Brother Yellett, you are a prince of a man, and you have served this church so faithfully as a wonderful man of God and a board member to this assembly. And we thank you and Sister Yellett for all of your service. To Sister Roxy, Brother Benny, Sister Ava Sue, Sister Amanda, Brother Mark, Lucy, and Stella. Your wife, your mother, your grandmother, your great-grandmother, she was a queen. And she wrote her name in big, bold capital letters across the fabric of all of our lives. And I promise you that not only will you miss her, but this church is going to miss her. And this entire community is going to miss her. Much has already been said about this wonderful lady so I just want to take just a minute. I will not be long, but I want to encourage you, the family. Remember this, that death is not painful. It is disease that causes this body to suffer. Death is actually a relief from all pain. The sting of death, when it talks about the sting of death, it is not referring to someone who is in Christ. The sting of death is actually in reference to someone who has not accepted the Lord. Or it's talking about for someone who has wasted their life. But Sister Yellett did not waste her life. So she doesn't know about the sting of death. Because the scripture says this, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death. Of his saints. And we look at death as like an absolute loss. But I want to encourage you just remember some of the material things that she left behind, some of the wonderful pictures of herself, some of her Bibles. I'm sure she had more than one. She left her Bibles. And then some of the handiwork, some of the things, the crafts, the things that she made. They all speak of three things. They speak of her love, her dignity, and her grace. Not only do each of you have great memories of her, but just know that her influence, the influence of her life remains. And those great qualities that were in her are in you, and it's going to live on. Roxy, Ava Sue, Amanda... Death cannot destroy a mother and a grandmother's prayers. Death cannot destroy a mother's wise counsel that she has given each of you through the years. Death cannot destroy the many, many years of tender loving care that she gave to you. And most of all, death cannot destroy the love that she showed to each of you. Death cannot destroy the fact that she still lives. Because Jesus said this, He that liveth and believeth in me, he or she shall never die. Death does not mean that Sister Bonnie is a loss to us because we will see her again. Can I get an amen? amen. Jesus said, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and they shall come forth. So here's just a couple of things I want you to remember as we wrap up this service. Number one, remember family that you're not alone and that God is with you. I don't know your pain because I haven't lived your life, but I know the pain that I felt the day that I laid my mother to rest. I know that pain. And I know that 
you can feel so alone. But I want to remind you, you're not alone. Even when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he is with you. Because all lives, all of us will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. None of us escape that. But just know you're not alone and the Lord is with you. Here's the second thing I want you to remember, Brother Yellett. Remember that God still has a purpose and a plan for you. He still has a purpose and a plan for you. Her book has been written. Her last chapter is complete, but yours is not. And I can promise you this. When you walk out of this room today, you're not going to walk out by yourself. The presence of the Lord and the power of the Lord is going to go with you. And God has a purpose because God is always good and God is not evil. And it's impossible for God to do you evil. He only wants to do good in your life. And God has a good plan for you, Brother Yellett. And he's going to give you the grace and the strength to carry that out. Are you going to grieve? Sure. Because grief is the price of love. And when you love deep, you're going to grieve deep. But remember, as you walk through the valley of grief, that God is always near and dear to the brokenhearted. He's going to give you his presence. And he's going to give you his power to get through the valley. And here's the last thing I want you to remember. That the reward will last forever. This is not the end of Sister Bonnie's story. She's going to be rewarded for all of her faithful service in Christ. Every pie that she made, every Sunday school lesson that she taught, every time she went out of her way to do a good deed, God keeps perfect records. And he doesn't miss one thing. And the minute she made heaven, the minute she started breathing that celestial air, you know what she said? It's worth it all. It's worth it all. So Brother Yellett and family, each of you in your own way are to be greatly commended for the way that you stood by your wife, your mother, your grandmother, and cared for her and was so attentive to her. Unfortunately, there's never the absence of problems in what we know as life. But you do have the presence of the shepherd. And Jesus said, I will be with you. You have the promise of his peace, Brother Yella, into this family. And you have the promise that his presence is not just going to stay here, but it's going to walk with you as you walk out of this room. Let's pray. Lord, what a great lady, what a great life, what a great legacy. We remember, Lord, all of the good, the laughter, the kindness. Lord, I remember her worship. I remember this precious woman of God, and she will be greatly missed. And it's just it's never easy to come to this point and to say goodbye. But Lord, help this family to remember that they are not alone. And just as you are the God of the mountains, you too are the God of the valleys. And so we ask for your help today during our season of grief and comfort this family and strengthen them through the power of your Holy Spirit and let them know they are not alone. In Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. Thank you. We turn this now back to our director.